for more than 10 years, the OECD has been developing tools to predict the toxicity of chemicals. And what I'm going to do is explain our long-term strategy for dealing with scientific developments in this area. And that's based on something called adverse out outcome pathways. Now, let me first give you some background. In OECD countries, the safety of chemicals has traditionally relied on testing using laboratory animals, lots and lots and lots of them. Different types of animals are used to investigate whether a chemical has effects on, say, the eyes, the skin, the nervous system, or for their potential to cause cancer or affect reproductive ability. Now, these are called in vivo tests. They're happening live on living things. And the advantage of in vivo tests is that they are uh, rigorous and provide information on the actual observed effects of exposure to a chemical, at least on the animal that they're being tried on. I mean, it's a real living thing which ends up getting cancer or not. There is something fairly sort of visceral about that and unpleasant. Now, for almost 35 years, the OECD has been harmonising uh, these test methods as OECD best uh, uh, test guidelines. And these are internationally recognised standards which, together with the principles of good laboratory practice, form the basis of our Council decision on mutual acceptance of data, which, as you know, I think even EPOC members know this, requires OECD countries to accept each other's test data, which has been developed for regulatory purposes, if the data were developed in accordance with the test guidelines and the good laboratory principles. And as you know, because we have that system and we can avoid a lot of duplication, we can avoid uh, non-tariff trade barriers, we estimate that saving governments about 150 million euros a year. So that's always the standard justification that we trot out. However, the whole process of testing chemicals is very expensive and very slow. And as a result, only a limited number of chemicals currently on the market, and it may be as little as 10 to 20 percent, have actually been tested and assessed for their human health and environmental safety. I just let you reflect on that. Only 10 to 20 percent. So as you could imagine, this pressure to test and to assess more chemicals and to get it done faster. But if you thought this was a race, I'd say the chemicals were winning hands down. Well, here are some of the legislative schemes in some of your countries that are either under review or likely to be reviewed. I think there's a clear recognition that without a change in testing and assessment strategies, the cost and time needed to do so is prohibitive, and a continuation of the current approach means ongoing public concern about using millions of laboratory animals. Animal welfare has been a significant driver here um, all the way through. That's the one which I suspect the public respond to most. Once you get inside the subject, you realise it's not just animal welfare that's the trouble, it's the fact that we're not actually assessing a lot of what people might assume we are assessing. Let me just give you an idea of why current testing can't keep up. If we test chemicals in a traditional way, on average around 5,000 animals are needed. That's on average. The duration of a test can be anything from a few days for acute toxicity to three years when we can investigate what might be the effect on offspring. The cost for one single test can be anything from $2,000, 2,000 euros to 2 million euros to do a two-species lifetime cancer study. Or to give you another example, to investigate the effects of a chemical on the reproduction of birds, around 200 animals need to be exposed to chemicals for around 30 weeks at a cost of a quarter of a million euros. 
Now, there are around 100,000 chemicals on the market. To get beyond the 20% that are currently assessed, we need new approaches that are cheaper, swifter, and don't pose such a challenge to animal welfare. For some toxicological effects, OECD standardised non-animal test methods are available. For instance, uh, to test for skin and eye corrosion, irritation, phototoxicity, genotoxicity, and endocrine disruption, just to name a handful. For instance, to test corrosivity and irritancy to skin, there are so-called in vitro methods, i.e., you know, in glass, in a test tube, available on reconstructed human skin models which closely mimic the upper layers of human skin. So you can actually do that on reconstructed bits of our skin. Another way to introduce changes in testing and assessment strategy is through the development of models to predict the toxicity of chemicals. And that's where this talk's now going to go. For example, we use a grouping approach where we look for chemicals which are structurally similar and therefore likely to have similar effects. So, now you have to look closely. Those of you who did chemistry will find this all much more approachable. Here you see a group of chemicals which all have a benzene ring and either or and chloride and nitro groups attached to the ring. Now, most of these chemicals here have been shown to cause allergic reactions. In fact, all the ones with a red cross. Although you'll notice one at the bottom right, which hasn't. So if we're presented with a substance that has not been tested, but has a similar structure compared with this group of substances, there it is, that's one we haven't met before, okay? We can assume that this chemical is also likely to cause allergies on the basis of similar structure. And we call that read across from a group of tested chemicals to an untested uh, chemical. Okay? We can also code the structural knowledge, and I've highlighted the common, some of the common bits there in red. We can code that that we've gained from all the chemical structures which are positive into a computer program. And we call this quantitative structure activity relationships, or QSARs. Okay, so it's automating that recognition, coding it so that you've got, you can run that against stuff. And you can apply that computer program to the target chemical. But you can also screen large inventories of chemicals to see if there are other chemicals out there that have a similar structure and that you could on that basis predict there would be allergies. So you see the scaling up by, 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 by choosing a structure uh, and then by scaling up, you, 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 you can get beyond one chemical at a time. But, but, there is still some uncertainty as not all of these chemicals will test positively for allergy, like the chemical on the right at the bottom. Let's put a ring around it. And the difference with this chemical and other chemicals is that it has just two groups attached to the benzene ring, while all the others have three or more groups attached to them. Now, that in itself is a useful piece of knowledge, and you could then decide that you would program your QSAR um, to search for those or to delete those. But, and this is the but, we don't really know why a chemical with only two groups attached to it doesn't elicit an allergy while a chemical with more groups attached does. So you've got a negative result, but you can't necessarily draw uh, a positive conclusion from it that you might want to. So, if we understand the mechanism by which these chemicals to cause toxicity, we can not only make a prediction, but explain why. And hence, we've got more confidence in the prediction. So, we have to move away from describing what happens in toxicology to explaining how it happens. Now, it might come as a shock to you 
and I'll tell you, it came as a shock to me. But for the overwhelming majority of chemicals, we don't understand the mechanism that causes the harmful effects in humans or wildlife we're worried about. I have to say, I naively believed <laughs> that we tested things because we knew what the mechanism was. We don't. We know what the mechanisms are when the chemical is a pharmaceutical. Why? Because it was designed to act by a specific mechanism to produce the effect. But we don't have that knowledge for industrial chemicals for the obvious reason that they weren't designed to have the effect that's worrying us. They were designed to do a job in industry, but nobody designed them to have the effect that we need to know about. It's a fundamentally important thing for those of you who don't work in chemicals to know. I didn't realise that. That was the biggest single thing which hit me. Here we are running a testing world, which is simply about saying, does this thing have an effect? We don't know why in many cases. So, what is the, the mechanism that causes allergy? To stick with this one. Well, in the case of allergy, we know that chemicals need to react with proteins to cause an immune response in the skin or in the lung, in, in, in which case we, we, we call it asthma. So you can develop simple test methods that detect chemicals that react with proteins. There they are. These are this is what in vitro tests are. And if we run all the chemicals in the group through the test system, we'll find out why this chemical at the bottom right of that diagram of chemical structures I showed you doesn't cause allergy. Now, overall... Bob advises me that we're becoming good at predicting simple adverse effects such as irritation or allergy with in vitro methods or QSARs, which allow us to predict these properties accurately for many more chemicals in a short time. But we haven't yet been able to develop such methods for more complex effects, such as toxicity to development, uh, or toxicity to reproduction. Now, if we want to make robust predictions for these more complicated effects, which can be induced by many different types of deregulations in the body, it becomes even more important that we understand the mechanisms that cause them. Only then can we pretend to develop the alternative non-animal methods to predict these effects. And at present, this knowledge is lacking. So, for this reason, the OECD launched a program in 2012 to develop Adverse Outcome Pathways, or AOPs. Now, these AOPs pull together and structure all the available information on how chemicals can cause specific harmful effects. Basically, an AOP contains the following information blocks. It starts with the molecular initiating event, which describes how a chemical interacts with a biological target, like DNA, which will then lead to a sequential chain of key events. That's the sort of squashed orange or squashed fly thing, you see? That's the key event. So the first one is the molecular initiating event. And each of these is an alteration in biological processes. So going up through the levels of the organism, first at the organelle level. So this might be effect on mitochondria. To effect at the cellular level, maybe an effect on enzyme activity, increased enzyme activity. Then to the tissue level. Then to an adverse uh, outcome either at the level of the organ, say the liver, uh, liver fibrosis. Um, or the level of the organism, or ultimately the level of the population, which is where there's fewer of them out there because something's messed up further down the chain. Now, there, there is the whole chain. So let me give you an example of an AOP, and this is, where, this is the sexiest of the presentations, <laughs> uh, in, in more ways than one. <laughs> it wasn't an intended pun. Um, you will first see, I'm going to show you an animation, um, you'll first see a biological pathway for egg production in female fish under normal conditions, okay? It starts with the conversion of testosterone 
to estrogen by an enzyme called aromatase. So there's the aromatase enzyme, um, which is uh, activated and generating the, the estrogen. So conversion of testosterone to estrogen using that enzyme. And the estrogen stimulates the production of a specific protein in the liver. And this protein is called vitelogenin or VTG. And it's, it's excreted by the liver into the bloodstream. To watch closely at this point, there it is being excreted into the bloodstream. And enters the ovary. Now, in the ovary, VTG is used to produce egg yolk, which is needed for the maturation and ovulation of eggs during the spawning period. And there, magically, out they pop, and lots of little fishlets appear. Now, some chemicals, like the fungicide fadrazol, fadrazol, I'll, 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 the word will go up in a minute, um, will inhibit aromatase, resulting in a reduction in the amount of estrogen that's produced. And if you've got less estrogen in the blood stream, um, that causes hepatocytes in the liver to produce less VTG. And if you've got less VTG in the bloodstream, that means there's less VTG taken up by the ovary, which then leads to less egg yolk, less mature eggs, and reduced ovulation. And if the concentration of fadrazol is high enough, the fish population could even decline. Now, I said all that, but now you can watch it happen, and I don't need to say anything. Here's the fadrazol, and watch what happens. And the saddest thing is that the slide malfunctioned that we didn't do... Oh, no, there it is. Now, there's a joke here. In fact, <laughs> the fish don't die. They just never get born. All right. <laughs> so that's just a little extra visual effect. Now, let me show you the same sequence as an adverse outcome pathway. The first step is the molecular initiating event, where the fadrazol is inhibiting the aromatase, followed by the next key event, which is the reduced synthesis of estrogen, followed by a lowering in the estrogen plasma concentration. The slower estrogen leads to reduced VTG production in the liver, resulting in lower VTG levels in the blood. This leads to a lower uptake in the ovary, which affects the normal egg production and ultimately leads to decreased spawning and population reduction. So there's the full adverse outcome pathway described in the terms that the people who do this work would describe it. Now, for the AOP I just showed you, methods have been developed to measure several key events along this pathway. For the first key event, the molecular initiating event, the bottom of that pyramid, methods are available that can measure the inhibition of aromatase in vitro or predict it by using chemical models. Okay, So these are non-animal tests at that level. The specific AOP has no key event on the organelle level, but at the tissue cell level. And here we've developed in vitro methods based on cultures of liver cells to measure the synthesis of VTG or based on isolated ovaries to measure estrogen synthesis. Now, the remaining key events can normally only be measured in living organisms. So this AOP not only provides regulators with the mechanistic information required to increase their confidence in decision-making, but it also helps towards the development and the use of non-animal methods to assess if a chemical can cause this type of endocrine-disrupting effect. Now, by using AOPs as a conceptual framework, results generated by quite different approaches can be related to key events along the adverse outcome pathway and linked 
to an adverse outcome and then used to take a regulatory decision. So just to remind, and I put the words on these slides here, these include computer models, which is called an in silico approach for obvious reasons, assays that measure chemical reactivity um, um, in chemico approaches, then in vitro methods in a test tube, and in vivo methods, and you'll see the top one's called field studies. That's a, a, also an in vivo method. And we call the combined use of results from these different types of methods something very confusing for those of us who lose our bags on airlines, IATA, which in this case, <laughs> in this case has nothing to do with losing your bags, but stands for Integrated Approaches to Testing and Assessment. For example, AOPs can improve the robustness of reading across results from one chemical to another untested chemical by showing that the chemicals are not only structurally similar, but they also act via the same adverse outcome pathway. So you see what we're doing? We're knitting together information which hasn't been previously knitted together. Here's an example. Let's assume we've got information available for a group of similar chemicals which are known to be endocrine disruptors, which was the subject matter of our dinner in February, and which all trigger the same molecular initiating event. Okay? And that we've got some in vitro data that shows that they cause the same effects along the adverse outcome pathway leading to reproductive toxicity. Now, if an untested target chemical has a similar structure, we've already got a suspicion that this chemical could be an endocrine disruptor as well. Now, by using a computer model, it can be shown that both the group of chemicals and the target substance in question inhibit aromatase. And based on this commonality, there's already strong evidence that the target chemical is going to be an endocrine disruptor as well. Now, confidence in this prediction could be further strengthened by testing the target chemical to measure the first and or the second key events along the adverse outcome pathway. Once again, by using these QSARs and in vitro methods, will be able to screen a much larger number of chemicals in a shorter time at lower cost. Obviously, there's going to be some uncertainty, and in some cases, it will be necessary to perform a test on an animal to get confirmation. But if you can use this information in a synergistic way, it's going to be on a much smaller number of chemicals and not all chemicals which are on the market. So, overall... AOPs can be seen as something of a knowledge bridge. On one side, we have all the computational and in vitro toxicity tests, and on the other, the regulatory predictive toxicology and AOPs can really build the, 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 the bridge over this gap by gathering and organizing scientific knowledge. This is, if you like, a toxicological uh, example of big data, uh, it's using large amounts of data to try to leapfrog from where we are. But, and I think this is important to stress, we still need more research to make a solid bridge on which regulators can rely. We're not there yet. And I'm just going to explain some of the complexities now before I finish. But I, when I say this, we're not there yet. You as countries are presiding over a chemicals program to which you are allowing the funding to slowly decline. These, you're advanced countries. You're supposed to be at the leading edge. Technology is creating opportunities to move the leading edge by a large amount. And you are actually not following it as you might. Uh, so I, I make this point. This is important stuff, and now would not be the moment to say, well, you know, we did a pretty good job over the last 40 years. Uh, we can no longer afford this stuff. It will move beyond you anyhow. The question is, who is in control of the knowledge and the processes? At this point, the OECD is the trusted place to do this work. It is very important that you as countries keep your own work programs going to be able to support the sort of work that we do here. So, 
When making predictions about the potential effects of a chemical, we have to realise that chemicals don't always, or even often, act via one simple adverse outcome pathway. Chemicals will often interact with different molecular initiating events, and as such, they initiate different toxicological pathways. Now, what I'm going to show you on this slide is how a chemical can, a single chemical, can trigger three different pathways. And it's all to do with the concentration of chemical. So you'll see that little needle at the bottom. When I click my mouse, you're going to see things happen. And what will happen is while the slide's running, the needle will go from left to right. So the concentration of chemical is going to increase. And at different levels of concentration, different levels of exposure, different pathways get triggered. So first pathway three, watch, is triggered as concentration is rising. Now pathway two, and as we get up to a high concentration, pathway three. Each one of those pathways can represent different outcomes for a single individual. For example, they could be developmental, reproductive or neurological effects. And to regulate the chemical, it's very important to know which one is the most sensitive. It's no use regulating for the top line if, in fact, at much lower levels, you're actually already triggering another pathway. We should also be aware of the possibility that a chemical triggers a pathway that's part of a network of pathways, and by triggering one molecular initiating event, several types of effects can be induced. Watch this animation in which one molecular initiating event triggers three pathways. Just watch. So you see that one event ended up triggering all three. So before, and, and this is where it gets very complex. You know, I said there's 100,000 chemicals out there. Before the AOP concept can be fully utilised for predicting complex types of effects, we really need a comprehensive library of adverse outcome pathways. In other words, we need to build a library of AOPs and know how they will interact with one another. Now, one of the concerns the NGO community currently has is that many early warning in vitro test results published by research teams end up being dismissed when it comes to regulatory decision making because regulators don't know what the results mean in terms of adverse effects in humans or wildlife. The library of AOPs is designed to help us interpret the results and either use them for decision making or for helping us ask for the right in vivo test to confirm the adverse outcome pathway. Once we, once we have the library, we might be able to make better predictions about the toxicity of mixtures of chemicals. I think the conclusion you draw from this is you're still going to need in vivo tests. But you're going to be, need far fewer and you can be much more targeted because you can do a lot of weeding out or a lot of triaging in, depending on which way you look at it. But it's a huge task. To build that sort of library is enormous, and it's far from complete. Last one here. Here you see a simple network where two chemicals trigger the same adverse effect via two different molecular initiating events. And you'll see in this animation that chemical one, at the highest concentration tested, doesn't completely activate the pathway. It's chemical one. So you see it stopped at that first key event. However, if the same organism is exposed simultaneously to the second chemical that triggers a different molecular initiating event, we can see that the response of the second key event is amplified, and now, watch, the pathway is completely activated. Now, I think that's very significant to understand because we're not living in a world where chemicals neatly interact with our bodies one by one. We're living in a world of chemical mixtures. We're living in a cocktail of stuff. So it's this mixtures issue which is also very important. Okay, quick run, race to the end. No more, no, no more nice slides. 
In order to collect information on AOPs, we've built what we call an AOP wiki, in which the knowledge of AOPs is described in an encyclopedia-style manner. And different scientific teams from around the world um, and their work have already included available information on 100 adverse outcome pathways on this wiki. Another collaborative tool is Effectopedia, in which all the pathway elements can be visualized, allowing us to capture all the detailed experimental data and models that quantitatively relate the key events to each other, and that will eventually allow us to predict the response in the key events alongside the adverse outcome pathway. This tool will also allow us to show networks of adverse outcome pathways and how different ones interact with one another. In the same way as the wiki, Effectopedia allows us to share results within the scientific community and set up research collaboration to develop or further refine AOPs. So, in conclusion, we believe that AOPs will help us to interpret in vitro test results and make the best use of existing knowledge on the mechanism of action. It will also offer new opportunities for international cooperation between different scientific communities to further extend our knowledge on the mechanism of action. Based on this knowledge, we might be able to better prioritise our resources and out of the 100,000 chemicals on the market, focus on the most hazardous chemicals for in-depth testing and assessment. If we have sufficient knowledge of AOPs and AOP networks, it will provide a framework to develop predictive tools based on alternative test methods such as in vitro methods or QSARs. And let me be clear, I want to be clear about this, we are not using AOPs directly as decision tools. Okay? They provide the information that allows us to build those tools. And of course, it will allow us to reduce the use of laboratory animals. So my take-home message for you as EPOC delegates, apart from ringing your colleague who comes to us on the Chemicals Committee and say, um, why didn't you explain all this to me? Um, <laughs> my take-home messages are as follows. One, support and champion the types of activities that, that are currently ongoing in your ministries your research institutions and in academia, universities, in finding alternatives to replace animal testing. Not just for the sake of the animals, but really for the sake of trying to actually improve the efficacy with which we can test and screen stuff. Secondly, support the development of a library of AOPs that's needed to fully realise the utility uh, of the system. To promote the use of tools uh, like the QSAR toolbox and Effectopedia as a powerful means of sharing results to improve the world of predictive toxicology. And finally, stimulate the scientific community setting up research collaborations and ultimately contributing to the understanding of mechanisms of action of chemicals. I think the work that's been pioneered uh, by many of you and coordinated um, here, by way of conversation and the development of these tools, it's taken a long time to get to this point. I think we, there is a critical mass issue. We really are now getting a grip on how this might all come together. So as I say, now is not the moment to think that you've actually done something great. Now is the moment to seize the momentum and the knowledge that's been created and turn it to use. Because as I say, and I'll finish on this note, I was shocked to learn how little we knew and how little we were able to knit together the knowledge we've got. And I think that's what we need to do much better. Thanks.